Hello, and welcome to this next episode of the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. We are treading into the shallow waters of our new episode, A Day in the Life of a School SLP. This episode is for all the students I work with, all the SLPs that I know that are considering stepping into a school system or working with children who are school-aged, whether that's in a school or private practice or maybe a charter school or anything like that. Um, We're pulling on a whole bunch of guests and I'm really excited. A reminder that I am not a school SLP and I have a very good friend who is. Her name is Katie Weidstrom Langraf. She's going to be hosting our episode today. And let me share with you who's going to be joining us. Her name is Caitlin Kelps. She is in her eighth year of being a speech language pathologist. She is passionate about student-led and focused intervention, AAC, Gestalt language development, and collaborating with other professionals. She feels she is lucky to serve in a variety of populations at both a high school setting and a self-contained elementary school. She absolutely loves her career, and she also enjoys reading, binging on Netflix, spending time with family and friends. And outside of work, she also has a TPT, Teachers Pay Teachers resource, for other professionals, speech pathologists, special ed shirts on her Etsy, and she's always seeking to learn more from other professionals and the population she serves. So this is going to be a great episode. Please, at the end, go check out Caitlin Kelps' TPT stores, Teachers Pay Teachers. And yeah, she's got a freebie. So when you go to the show notes, you're going to find that there. Lots of things happening with this episode. Really glad you're here and sit back because we are going to have Caitlin and Katie join us very soon. Welcome back to A Day in the Life of a School-Based SLP. My name is Katie Weidstrom Landgraf, and I am here with Caitlin Kelps. Hello, Caitlin. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. We are so excited to have you. I'm also very excited. (laughs) Yes. Uh, We have lots of things to talk about, and uh, I think we're just going to jump right in. I'm so excited interested in hearing first just a little bit about you and your journey. What led you to becoming a school-based SLP? Let's start there. Absolutely. This story always kind of cracks me up. Since about sixth or seventh grade, I was set on being an occupational therapist. And then I went to the Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind to do a research project my junior year of college. And I was looking at service providers and their impact on deaf and blind students. And I ended up watching the speech pathologist the whole time instead of the occupational therapist. And I made the switch. Wow. That is an amazing story. Okay. So it, it was, it was like you met your destiny when you went to do that observation. Absolutely. I always think that's amazing when that happens. So uh, we know you work in the schools but we don't know much about what you do specifically in the schools. Do you think you could talk to us a little bit about that? Maybe about your specific setting and uh, some of those things. A day in the life. (laughs) A day in the life of Caitlin Gelps. Yes, yes. I have a little bit of a weird split. So I am at the high school in my school district and I service complex language all the way to AAC and functional life skills. And then I also service a first and second grade classroom of functional life skills, AAC, Gestalt language processing at one of our elementary schools. So like two total opposite ends of the spectrum. Wow. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about what that's like? Because uh, I am imagining for our listeners out there, they might be thinking, wait a minute, what? She says she works at an elementary school and a high school. So can you maybe talk to us a little bit more about how that works for you in a given week or maybe even within a single day. Absolutely. It kind of changes year to year based on student need. So this year I travel two days a week. I spend a whole day at the elementary school and then two afternoons. I think it's two hours one day and one hour another day, just kind of on my way home based on a student's attendance. So there's that. So my, even my start schedule changes. Some days it's, I'm at work at seven. Some days I don't have to be there till eight fifteen. 
and then my end changes. So it's a little bit of flexibility, a little bit more. I make my own schedule on that, like those travel days and things, which is kind of nice for me. That's nice. I like to change it up and stay on my toes. I think I'd get a little bored in one school. So sure. So when you talk about traveling. Could you explain a little bit more about what you mean by uh, a travel day or what it means to travel um, within your schedule? Absolutely. So since the schools are on different times Mm -hmm. for their start and things, I start Mondays and Fridays. I'm at the high school all day. So I go seven till two 30 Tuesdays and Thursdays. I go to both the high school and the elementary school. So I don't get to the high school until 8.15. And then around lunchtime, 12.30, 1, I get in my car. I take my lunch in my car as a nice little break. I wouldn't have to do that. My travel time is not my lunchtime. That's built in separately. And then I end up at the elementary school, and then I go home from there. Wednesdays, I'm at the elementary school. Today. So just traveling two days a week. The variety and it is on sounds my way. great. It is. And it is on my way home. That's always my, because I've traveled for eight years in two different districts. And people always ask, like, don't you hate it? But I plan it so that way I go to the school on my way home as my second. So, Caitlin, are you in a larger school district, smaller school districts? So I think uh, when I imagine travel, sometimes I imagine driving to a school within the district just a couple miles away. But I do know for some of our colleagues, travel can mean I'm going to a different small town near the town that I'm currently working in. Uh, So for you personally, what what are the demographics? My schools are only about 10, 15 minutes apart, depending on traffic. So it's so nice. Demographic wise, that's also quite diverse for my school, not so much for my whole district. But my schools are quite diverse and they, my elementary school feeds into my high school, which I haven't worked in the district long enough, but eventually I'll get to see some of my friends again. <laughs> That's always fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, it's, it's pretty great to see your little people uh, become teenagers. So that is, uh-huh. that is. As always- adults. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's great. So um, when you think about your job and its totality, what is your favorite part, and I'm going to say some of your favorite parts of your job, because I I can't narrow it to one. I imagine that's hard to do for you too. Yeah. I think connections with my students is always number one. That's probably the most fun. I think as speech pathologists, we get the advantage of getting to play and do fun things or very meaningful things with our older students. Uh, So we have kind of a different connection with students than a lot of teachers or other service providers even. And then my absolute other favorite part is actually staff collaboration. Uh, You know we have to talk more about that. Tell us more about staff collaboration. What do you love about it? Uh, How does it make your favorite part of the job list? Like, can you just talk more about all things uh, staff collaboration based? Mm -hmm. It looks different at both levels. So at the elementary level, we are sitting down. I am in the classroom that day and a half that it totals up to be that I'm in there. I am in there that whole time. Um, Unless on Wednesdays, I'm leaving to go take a lunch or something. Mm -hmm. I take my contractual breaks. But so I'm training TAs in the morning. Every single week, we do a 15 minute quick little collaboration. And one week, I even leave it up to them of, what questions do you have? What do you want to learn about? We bring in the teacher. The teacher and I co-treat or co-plan literacy, two different activities a week. So we do literacy centers. So it's a book. It's some sort of toy with a core vocabulary word, sight word, letter, and then some sort of sensory activity. And then we kind of follow that up the next day as well with some predictable chart writing and early literacy skills. At the high school, it's helping plan community-based instruction going out into the community and working on some of those functional communication skills. We still work on literacy there. I'm pushing into, we have an executive functioning class. So I sit down with the teacher once a month, then we talk about, here's how I would approach it from the speech and language point. How would you do that? Collaborating on goals, sitting down and co-treating with PT or OT. So there's a lot of different collaborating that happens. And it's 
just fun to learn from other people. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I think Mm -hmm. uh, when you can build capacity with your colleagues, that feels really good too, because I think sometimes what can plague us uh, in the profession of speech language pathology is that our colleagues don't always know what we do and they don't always understand how those underlying processes are so critical for what we ask kids to do with learning. And so any opportunity for collaboration, I think, is a a chance for magic to happen. Yes. Um, When I started at my school, they said, well, it's just speech, even at the high school. And they've had speech pathologists in and out for however long school's been there. And now they're finally kind of coming along and seeking me out, which is nice. And I think you make a great point uh, that you know, that con- that concept of it's just speech. I had a principal that didn't realize that um, I treated language disorders despite multiple conversations. Like, it just didn't click. And so I think sometimes there can be a tendency to, to stop with the speech part of what we do, and yet so much of what we do is not speech in a school setting. And, and so I agree with you that uh, it, mm-hmm. it's an opportunity uh, to engage and to learn from each other. Yes. Uh, so I have to ask you the flip side um, uh, the, of the question, what is your favorite part? The flip side is what is the most challenging part of your job? Ooh, that's t- scheduling in a school. I think it's everybody's worst nightmare. The high school, their schedule switch at the semester and you have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. As much as I love collaboration, it can also be the worst part. If I'm being honest, because you meet those teachers or other service providers who don't want to collaborate, don't want to incorporate the speech and language. And that for me is extremely frustrating. I pride myself on being student led and student centered. So then when that happens, it doesn't feel great. Mm. Yeah. And I appreciate you talking about that uh, because I think that there can be as many different staff members as there are in a school. You can have as many different experiences with collaboration. And it doesn't mean that it, it will always stay that way. But I do agree no. with you that it can it can swing wildly and it can change depending upon the the person that we're working with um absolutely so when you think about what you do and why you do it i always say there's this sometimes it's an unspoken driver there's a big why what is your big why why do you why do you keep coming back day after day year after year We have this joke at school, actually, that goes around that. Everyone at the end of the day always asks me specifically if I feel like I made a difference that day. And it's a joke because I always say yes and I mean it. And again, that relationship that we as speech pathologists get to have with kids is very different from teachers. So teachers, if one kid is kind of acting out, then the lesson for the whole day might go awry. Whereas in our smaller setting, I truly feel like kids are coming down and saying, I know that we work on reading comprehension, but I had a fight with my best friend and I need to problem solve it. And then we switch gears to more of that pragmatic language side. And so every single day, I feel like I made a difference to at least one kid. I think you bring up a really great example of how what we do can be so flexible and so immediately useful to mm-hmm. the students we serve. And, and I think that flexibility is so important because if a kid's distracted by that fight, they're not going to be able to do comprehension anyway. And the beauty of language is that we use language all the time for everything. We're using it to mediate our thinking. We're using it to communicate with others. So pretty much anything can be fodder for language intervention. And absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, when I think about uh, some of the folks who are listening to this podcast, I think about what I might like to know if I were brand new and I was just 
starting in the world of communication sciences and disorders. Is there a piece of advice or uh, something you would want a person to know who is considering working in the school setting? Absolutely. If you are going into the school setting, I always advise when I have student observers or things like that, prioritize those first couple weeks to make connections with teachers. Your connections with students will come because you're doing fun things, motivating things, meaningful things. But if you want that buy-in for collaboration and to make your life easier for scheduling, writing IEP goals, et cetera, that relationship with teachers is key. That's great. Uh, so, Caitlin, I do want to take some time to talk about uh, some of your passions and your interests um, that relate to what you do for your job, but that maybe not everyone knows about. Uh, based on what I read, I saw you have like a TPT store. I do. Etsy uh, store. Can you talk to us about some of these things too? Yeah, I always joke that my hobby is speech pathology, which we know isn't <laughs> totally healthy to be work all the time. <laughs> So the Teachers Pay Teachers in Etsy is a creative outlet for me, but also related to speech where I'm getting to provide resources or shirts or things for people that also love AAC or Gestalt Language Processing, Executive Functioning, Neurodiversity. And so that's just kind of a nice little outlet. Sometimes after a stressful day, I want to come home and create a new product, product on Teachers Pay Teachers. Because I know that it's going to help somebody. I get to kind of mess around with graphic design type things. So uh, that sounds amazing. Now, you listed a lot of things um, when you were talking about like student, student led interventions, Gestalt language processing, executive function. I I know we maybe won't have time to go into all of those things, but can you talk a little bit about, about some of those passions? Because even as you're speaking to us about it, I can see you lighting up. I wish our listeners can see you, but I'm sure they can hear you lighting up about these different topics. So uh, could you talk a little bit about, in whatever order you'd like to tackle, uh, <laughs> some of those things? Absolutely. I would say right now, the number one passion for me is making sure that I'm using that student led, student motivated, and a more affirming approach for students. So that way they're comfortable, they're willing to problem solve and open up with me, which then leads into maybe a student is speaking, but we want to try AAC because they have meltdowns and can't access their language. Maybe a student prefers to use scripts that they learned from a TV show that Gestalt language processing and how are we going to make that more effective for them? I love teaching staff about it and encouraging them to kind of acknowledge those differences as just differences and not deficits and just watching even their relationship with kids grow because the trust is there. When we're constantly correcting kids about the way they use their device, about scripting, their social skills, you can just kind of see the defeat. Mm. And so when we're a little bit more open about those things, they light up, which is awesome. Yeah, I think creating that environment that says it's okay to take this like learning risk and to try something mm -hmm. new is so important for that larger goal of progress in therapy. And uh, if, if it feels like a correction, it does... Mm -hmm. It does take the wind out of your sails. And I think it limits the ability to make progress. Absolutely. Um, I, I like that idea of this shared collaboration where you're partnering with the student versus I'm the knower and the director. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when we think about how that affects intervention over time, you get further faster if that trust is there. Absolutely. Uh, Especially with those older kids. For sure. Yeah. Because a lot of them have been told what to do for years and then they come to high school and they don't know how to advocate for their needs because they may not even know what their needs are. So if we mm -hmm. take a step back and kind of even ask, well, why did you do that? Rather than just, you can't do that. That's inappropriate. We get right. some insight then on how they can advocate or ask for a break 
and the reasoning behind some of those behaviors. Or things. So I know that you said that speech language pathology is your hobby also, in addition to it being your job. Yes. But we also know that we want Caitlin Kelps around for the next 20 years. So what mm-hmm. are some things you do to recharge. I did hear you mention earlier in our conversation uh, where you said, I take, I am sure to take my contractual breaks. So can you, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by contractual breaks and other ways you might recharge or take care of yourself knowing that you love what you do? Absolutely. At work, I call it my protected time. So whether that's even we get work days two times a year, I think it is. And I make sure to tell people right on my door, I'm in a work day, do not come in. And kind of setting that boundary, it's really hard for me, but it's something I've worked on. It's really important, even lunch. So if people come in during my lunch, I'll say, is this a social visit or a work visit? Because it's my lunch. So teachers kind of know at this point that I use the term protected time and I pick It's not even all of my lunches because I'm really bad at saying no, (laughs) but one or two a week where they know Tuesdays and Thursdays, Caitlin's not available during her lunch Mm -hmm. because she's taking a breather and that's what she needs to be able to help us later at her full capacity. Outside of school, I go to therapy because I do have work stress and that's helpful. I like to read. I binge watch TV. (laughs) I don't do anything on Sundays. So that way I'm recharged for the day. And that includes working. I don't even look at my schedule until Monday morning when I get to work, which is hard, but helpful. I really appreciate how you have those boundaries around your time and how you normalize that for your colleagues. So, you know, it's nothing personal. It's what I have to do to stay available and present and connected with what we're ultimately doing for kids. Mm-hmm. So I think I think that's so important, especially um, when we are passionate about what we do, when we love what we do, it can sometimes be difficult to have those boundaries and to have the off switch and to have it not kind of end up being a source of, of stress or burnout. Uh-huh. <laughs> so the way that I really appreciate that... Um, you have some ideas and thoughts for us about how to like take care of ourselves to keep doing what we love and keeping our love for it. I do think there can sometimes be a risk that uh, with all the demands and pressures, it, it can be a risk of maybe losing some of that passion. So that's, Mm -hmm. that's so helpful. Um, I do want to circle back a little bit. I realized that when we talked about your Etsy store and we talked about your teachers pay teachers store we don't know the names of oh any my of goodness things. or where we can find you caitlin can you talk a little bit about where we can find all of this great stuff absolutely my instagram and teachers pay teachers are both the communication classroom okay and then my etsy store is communication class i think because it wouldn't all fit. (laughs) Okay, okay. Um, And kind of driven by that idea that I love collaboration and I love getting into classrooms and working with everybody on that communication piece and how to incorporate it. Very cool. So as I'm thinking about um, this whole experience, I'm curious to know how long you've worked in the school so far. This is my eighth year. Do you imagine yourself in another setting or does this just feel right for you or can you not say because you're so present in the moment (laughs) i it's really hard the affirming piece that i give to students isn't quite a school model yet um teachers want students to use intonation in their voice and we know that we shouldn't really tone police students, Mm -hmm. if they use a monotone Mm -hmm. voice, it doesn't make them less effective of a communicator. If they use decreased eye contact, it doesn't make them less of a communicator. And that's kind of hard for me to match right now. So I have been joking, but not really joking with my coworkers that in two years, I will no longer be in schools. And hopefully I will have a private practice of my own, but we'll see. 
I think I would really miss the collaboration piece, but who knows? And, and so based on what you're saying, what I'm hearing is that that affirming piece and finding or creating a space maybe where the approach is one of um, accentuating the strengths and differences mm-hmm. versus correcting the issues and disorders is kind of that yes. larger, it's long range focus. Meeting, meeting students where they're at yeah, because they are who they are. And there's really great things about who they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Caitlin, I could talk to you all night. Um, <laughs> this is this is wonderful. Um, as we start to wrap up here, I'm curious to know, are there any, I guess, unsaids or takeaways or things that we should really talk about that we've missed? Oh, I don't know. I would say for me, I actually am neurodivergent. I do have ADHD. So I guess another tip that I have for those that struggle with executive functioning or even just getting into the field right away, it's overwhelming, is also don't feel pressured to organize yourself the way that people want you to. This year, after seven years and everybody saying, you need a Google calendar so we can see where you're at. I tried it and I missed a meeting. So I went back to my paper calendar (laughs) because I know that that works. And I think sometimes schools want us, even as grownups, to do things in a way that makes sense to them. But if it makes sense for you, whether it's how you take data or organize your meetings or anything like that, do what works best for you and makes you the more effective speech path. Wow. That's amazing and inspiring. And I'm writing down what you say as you say it. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your time, Caitlin. No we problem. We appreciate it so much. Absolutely. It was wonderful chatting. That was a fun episode. I am so glad you listened all the way through to the end of that. I am in the background and I'm not saying anything and I'm just laughing and I want to put things in the chat to contribute to the conversation, but I didn't because the two of them were just pinging off of each other and really having a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I hope you had a lot of takeaways from there. Please go check out Caitlin's TPT store and everything else that she has to offer, Etsy and all of that. Also, we are working hard here at Fresh SLP, really making something for new and transitioning SLPs. Drop us a line. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. Join in our community on Facebook, Fresh SLP. Um, Gosh, we've got a membership site on our website. We just have some really fun things that we're working on, making the world, making our profession better for all of us, all of us involved. We look at the negative, we look at the, the positive, and whatever we do, we are learning. So like us, follow us, share us, help boost us, help support us in any way you can. Have a great night and we'll see you 